Welcome to Bible Line. But we are uh, continuing our series, The Way, The History of the Christian Church. And we have a couple of interesting figures to cover tonight. And we're also going to dive into a little bit of some churches' practices of, do you know what iconography is and intercession of the saints? In uh, introduction, just to kind of catch you up a little bit, around 600, uh, we had the invasion of the Anglo-Saxons that moved into Britain. And uh, the Brits were kind of pushed off into the outer areas right there and uh, uh, pushed into the north and to the west, the west being Wales. And the Brits still had remnants of Christianity. Remember uh, St. Patrick or, or Patrick? Uh, when he went to Ireland, you know, he was he was from this area here, and uh, he was a Christian and all. But they they had kind of been pushed off to the north and pushed off to the west as the Anglo's and the Saxons, or the Angles and the Saxons, moved in. And uh, uh, Pope Gregory, we talked about him that he had sent Augustine as a missionary to the Angles and the Saxons, and uh, um, it was uh, a. They were afraid it was a suicide mission because these people were very aggressive and, and they had uh, violent ways. And so they thought, you know, uh, Augustine's going to get there and, you know, we're just, we're just all going to die. But he gets there, he preaches the gospel. They accept the gospel. Surprisingly, have you ever uh, tried to witness to somebody and you thought it was useless and you got a positive response and you were like surprised? You know? Or I've had people uh, tell me, you know, I prayed that God would do something and he did it and not. I was surprised. Well, you prayed. <laughs> uh, and so sometimes we're surprised by uh, the results. But the, the, the people accepted the Lord and uh, so turned turn to Christianity. And uh, Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury. And in 680, uh, Boniface was born in England. And uh, he was of Anglo-Saxon heritage. And this is several generations after Augustine that I was just talking about. And uh, so he was uh, born into a Christian home. His parents weren't really like, uh, you know, they weren't clergy or anything like that. They were just like regular people, if that makes any sense. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the clergy in the room is laughing. Because of, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Uh, they, they were just, uh, you know, normal Christians. <laughs> they weren't. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not doing a good job at this tonight. <laughs> they were, I don't even know what that means. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> they, they, uh, but uh, Boniface had, he just had a uh, sense about him that, uh, of duty and service to God. Just seemed like you know one of those that he just had a desire to to do something for God even at a young age, and in 716 at the age of 36, he felt God was calling him to be a missionary to the German Franks. So uh, w we talked about this previously. This area right here, where, where the Franks moved into this area, Clovis had kind of consolidated this area. Uh, and, and Christianized them. And so this is several generations later, but this is, this is kind of a Christian area. Well, these areas up here, Frisia, is, uh, that's like the German Franks in this area, and Saxony is uh, the, the German Saxons, and they were still given to a lot of pagan ways. And so there was a lot of uh, paganism up there and idol worship and, and all of this. And so uh, Boniface decides this is where I feel God's calling me to go. So he goes over there, and uh, at the, uh, he he uh, uh, w started looking up, looking for the place that he believed was like the most holy place that he could find. You know, where's the place that they really uh, worship or whatever? Well, he found this mountain called Mount Mount Gutenberg, that was the place that they seemed to go for worship. So he goes up to this mountain, and there was a huge oak. That was called Thor's Oak. Anybody ever heard of Thor? So Thor was believed to be the god of war. Uh, he flew around with a hammer and he made uh, lightning and thunder and hurricanes. All this was under his control. And so this was this was Thor's Oak. So he goes up and, and he finds this this place. The people were up there. They were worshiping and and uh, you know bowing down to Thor in this area. So he goes up there and he starts preaching that they need to turn away from their pagan ways and they need to turn to the one true God and His Son Jesus Christ. It wasn't received very well. 
And so they were, you know, kind of coming back at him and, and uh, throwing a fit a little bit. And so he stood up. He said, in three days, I'm coming back and I'm challenging Thor right here on the spot. And so everybody's like, okay, you know, we got to see this because, you know, we want to see some lightning and we want to see some thunder, you know. And, and so three days later, um, uh, all, all the crowd gathered and people started gathering up on this mountain around Thor's Oak and they're ready for this challenge to take place. And Boniface shows up with an axe. And he goes straight up to the tree and he starts whacking on this tree. And everybody jumps back. They're like, okay, you know, there's going to be some serious lightning at any minute. And he kept chopping, and he kept chopping, and he kept chopping. It took him a half a day, but eventually Thor's oak falls. And everybody waits, and nothing happens. And so he stands up and he says, now. And they listen to him. He preached the gospel. And they accepted, and he baptized hundreds that day, and, and in subsequent days baptized thousands for the, for the, the sake of the Lord. Uh, I just want to pause that part in the story and just ask you, how confident are you in God? You know, it takes a lot of confidence. Of course, he knew. <laughs> he knew there wasn't really a Thor. That, and, you know, he wasn't really afraid of lightning, per se. But the people could have done something. They could have rebelled or they could have, they could have threw a fit and threw him off the mountain or, or whatever. But he was, he was confident enough to stand up. How confident are you to stand up and make claims about God? Because it can be scary, right? You know, when, when somebody's facing uh, maybe a disease or, or COVID or cancer or, uh, you know, sinus problems or <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, you know, and to say, I can pray for you and God will heal you. We don't, we don't like to be that bold sometimes, do we? Because what if it didn't happen, right? But I think through the Holy Spirit, God can give us confidence to go into every situation. And I'm sure that Boniface was probably full of the Holy Spirit. And, and he goes up, goes up to this tree, and he had confidence that God was going to show up that day. And he didn't have a second, he didn't, he didn't, at least the story goes, I wasn't there, obviously, but I don't picture him going up and, and you know, sizing up the tree and, well, and I don't know if I ought to do this. I just picture, I should have brought an axe tonight. That would have been fun. But I, I, I picture the crowd standing there and Boniface just, he just comes up and, y'all get back. Whack! And just getting after it. We can be bold. We can be confident in our God. Because the Holy Spirit will give you power to stand. And, uh, and God will do amazing things when we show our faith. So Boniface, uh, he, he did two things after the tree fell and after the baptismal service and all that. They chopped up the tree and he took enough wood to, to make it through the winter. And he took the rest of the tree and built a church. So can you imagine now going to church in the wood that used to be Thor's, uh, Thor's oak. God can take things that used to be used for the devil's business and he can take it and make it something. We sing a song like that, don't we? Yeah. You know, what, what the enemy meant for evil, he turned it for good. And God can take situations and whatever situation in your life that you face that may be an evil situation, that may be a bad situation, that may be a sickness or that, that may be something that, that puts you on death's door, he can take something that the, the devil meant for harm or for evil and he can turn it for good and for his glory. And we can be confident in that. So Boniface met, uh, ministered for another 30 years in that area and uh, his ministry was really successful throughout that agent region except for uh, one area of oh, I didn't put the map. let me go back to the map one area way up in the north up here of Frisia uh, they had still kind of clung to the the pagan ways okay and so he got a group of monks together and he said okay we're going to go up and we're going to you know do this one last push to, to these people and, and bring the gospel to them. So they're camping out in that territory up there, and they looked up on the hill, and they saw, they saw like a, a glistening of metal, and they recognized it being swords and shields and people coming down the, the hill toward them. And the monks that he was with, they were armed, and so they drew their swords, and Boniface said, put away your swords. 
because God will fight our battle for us. But guess what? They were slaughtered that day. And so, you know, we can look at, at things like that and say, well, you know, God, God delivered a, a mighty um, victory for Boniface that one time, but what happened this other time? You know, and they, they became martyrs for the faith. And, and you might think, you know, wouldn't it have been a better story if, you know, God would have raised up some kind of big, uh, you know, waterfall and washed the enemy off the mountain or whatever? You know, that would have been a great story. But instead, we see that they lost their lives for the sake of the gospel. Remember when we were talking about Tertullian and he said a statement, something to the effect that the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It wasn't just uh, not long after that, other missionaries went up into that area and the people were one for the Lord and turned to Christ. And so even though Boniface may not have seen it during his lifetime, the, the complete Christianization of this area, it did happen, and he had a lot to do with that in, in his testimony and the, thing, the work that he did. During uh, his ministry, Boniface, Boniface was supported by somebody we talked about uh, last week, and that's, y'all remember Charles Martel? Charles the Hammer. And so Charles Martel, he's, he's the mayor of the palace in this area. And if you weren't here last week, just to catch you up just a little bit, the uh, Merovingian kings were, they were, uh, I guess you could say kind of like empty suits, so to speak. Uh, they, were, they were public figureheads, but the kings really didn't rule. Uh, they were, you know, they had wealth and power and, and whatever just in the uh, sense of position. But the country was really ruled and the military was really ruled by what's called the mayor of the palace. So Charles Martel was the, the mayor of the palace in this area. And he really believed in Boniface and the work that he was doing. And so Charles Martel, uh, he would uh, support him financially and support him uh, to, to help keep him safe uh, in, in uh, I guess, as much as he could during that time. And uh, supported his, his work in the north. He's, he's the mayor of the palace in the 700s, and uh, he's, of course, we talked about last week, he was successful in stopping Islam from coming up into, um, coming up into uh, the Frankish kingdom. In 737, uh, five years after the Battle of Tours, the king that he had set up dies, and he just decided, I'm not going to set up another king. Who needs a king, right? And so he basically ruled on his own until his death um, in 741. And uh, Charles was succeeded by his son, Pepin, who is historically known as Pepin the Short. I like it better in French as Pepin le Bref. Uh, you know, kind of, you know, breath kind of smell, I mean, <laughs> kind of smells. No, kind of sounds like something brief, doesn't it? <laughs> so, but uh, Pepin the Short, Pepin le Bref. Um, so he became king, and, and uh, temporarily he set up Cheldric the third. Uh, to the throne in 743 as king to kind of continue the Merovingi Mer Merovingian dynasty. And so they went again with a king, but he was, uh, he looks like a king with his crown and everything like that, but he was the mayor of the palace. Now, the Lombards, remember those guys? Remember the Lombards? Uh, they were kind of in that area. We'll see a map again in a minute, and you, it'll have it on there. But uh, they were between the Frankish kingdom and Italy, and the Lombards controlled kind of down to central Italy. And uh, they were largely Aryan in their Christian belief. And so they started putting a lot of pressure on Rome and, and were coming down like they were going to maybe take over Rome or, or something like that. So the uh, Pope at the time, he sent a message to Pepin and said, hey, you know, these Lombards, they're about to run me over over here, and so we need some help. And so Pepin comes down, and uh, uh, Pepin, uh, whoop, go back up just a little bit. Uh, he marches over the Alps through the Lombard territory and defeats them and, and pushes the Lombards back. And so Pepin sets up kind of a buffer zone called the Papal States, if you've ever heard of that. And uh, it's not as much, you know, like right now, the Vatican City is kind of its own country. You know, it has, but uh, at that time, the Papal States were a lot bigger than what Vatican City is now. And so it was like their own uh, territory, if you will, to kind of give Rome more of a buffer zone or give, give the Pope a little more of a buff, buffer zone from uh, people coming in. So in return, 
Pope Stephen, Stephen was the Pope at the time, crowned Pepin the King of the Franks. And so this is where you have a change from the Merovingian dynasty to what's called the uh, Carolingian dynasty. And that was named after uh, Charles Martel, his, his father. So you have you know, Carolingian Charles, if you can kind of get the, the name association there. Anyway, so when uh, Pepin died, he divided the throne between his two sons. His two sons were Carloman and Charlemagne. And so he said, okay, you know, I'm going to divide the kingdom between my two sons. And there was really a fierce, rival, a fierce rivalry between the two. Uh, the two, two boys didn't get along too good. And uh, uh, about four years later, Carloman died of natural causes unexpectedly. And uh, Charlemagne, an Charlemagne annexed his brother's territory to unite the kingdom. And there's no evidence that you know, Charlemagne had anything to do with his brother's death. It just seems all, awfully convenient, doesn't it, that, you know, that, it, that it happened. But anyway, uh, Charlemagne becomes sole king in uh, 771, and he's very devoted to his Christian faith. And he, he loves the Lord. He wants to do right by the church and right by uh, Christianity. Uh, his favorite book to read was Augustine. Uh, especially the city of God, if you remember us talking about that, he would have that read to him while he ate and, and certain activities. He would have, you know, some, these Christian books or uh, uh, books of the uh, church fathers read to him. Uh, he was generous to the poor, not only in his other country, uh, his own country, but he would hear about uh, maybe some Christians. Uh, maybe in some type of need in another country or whatever, and he would funnel money to them to, to help support them, not just like a one time, but like ongoing. And he would befriend certain kings of other countries so he could influence them to be kind to the Christians in their countries. Um, he built around 30 cathedrals and over 400 monasteries across his kingdom. You know, Charlemagne is uh, all, almost... Um, at constant war with his borders. So this was kind of where he started out in this area here. And there was all this war going on in these other areas. This is the Lombard kingdom right here. And so during Charlemagne's time, he actually is able to uh, subdue these extra areas right here and bring them all into the kingdom and unify them and, and bring them under one rule. The only real defeat that he had was he when he tried to go down into Spain and push back the... Uh, the Moors, if you remember, they were the, the people in that region that had converted to Islam, became known as the Moors. Uh, he was soundly defeated, and uh, there's a, a poem or a song, if you will, that's, that's pretty famous called The Song of Roland. Anybody ever heard of that? No, we, I don't think we sing it around here much in South Arkansas. But anyway, it's, it's kind of a, and it was written about that time or that defeat, okay? Uh, anyway, so this became... The red dotted line right there became the kingdom that Charlemagne uh, ruled over. <clears throat> um, let's talk about Charlemagne and the Carolingian Renaissance. There was a lot of things that, that Charlemagne did during that time. This picture is a, a statue of uh, Charlemagne that's outside Notre Dame. I took this picture when we were over there in 2012, and so I thought I'd, I'd use it since I had the, the rights to use my own picture. Uh, but this this uh, big, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about trying to talk Brad into doing his beard like that, like to, you know, come, come out like that. That would be that'd be kind of fun. Uh, but Charlemagne is is really revered in France and and even in Europe. Uh, you'll see a lot of references to him being referred to as the father of modern Europe uh, because of a lot of his reforms and a lot of things that he did. Uh, he promotes. Orthodox Christianity throughout his kingdom, and and uh, this probably did the most to root out. Because remember the fight between Orthodoxy and Arianism, and it was pretty much squashed until the the tribes from the north started pushing back in because they had been Christianized by Arian missionaries. So this brought Arianism back into the area, especially through the Lombards. And so when he conquered that area and promoted. Orthodox Christianity that again squashed uh, Arianism for the time. Um, he promotes mandatory tithing, and so a lot of our concepts or our our thoughts toward uh, giving 10% actually came from him. I mean, it was our, it's it's in the Word of God, and it's you know, but 
not in not in a, an authoritative way as the way that he put it down. He's pretty much, you know, like I'm the king, you're given 10%. <laughs> and so, you know, um, he uh, makes an effort to make sure that the club, clergy were sufficiently ed- educated, and uh, he he it worried him a little bit that there were some uh, some clergy or some priests that weren't properly uh, preparing their sermons. And so he had some sermons prepared for them, saying, you know, if, if you can't put together a sermon, then here's you some sermons to read. So and that's the, I think that was the first sermons.com. Right. So, <laughs> uh, he made sweeping reforms to uh, the way that wealth was accumulated and uh, the paying of taxes and reforms to the legal system and the way records were kept. And uh, he builds this uh, magnificent palace in Aachen, which Aachen is, Aachen is in now uh, modern-day Germany. Uh, but this, and part of the palace is still there. Other renovations have happened around the area or whatever, but just, just one little part of it is still there. But it was this uh, magnificent chapel. It had this big room where they could meet and have, uh, like, I guess, councils and, and things like that. And then off to the side there was a, of that, there was a tower that housed... Uh, some 7,000 plus manuscripts and books and and writings from all over the area. And some say that a lot of those books or writings would have been lost forever had it not been for Charlemagne preserving them in this tower or repository. Uh, He also had a, um, uh, there there was like this huge chapel and it was almost like three chapels in one. So this big chapel that he built, there was three chapels inside of there. I don't know. I, I didn't see this explicitly in, in the information that I read, but it kind of makes me feel like the three-in-one chapel was almost a Trinitarian, you know, kind of an ode to Trinitarianism. Uh, but, it, but, you know, it has this uh, magnificent chapel. Um, he even had a zoo and a gymnasium. I mean, this was a, quite an elaborate uh, palace that he had. He brings some of the most intellectual minds from across Europe uh, to Aachen to help with his reforms. You know, he didn't just come up with all this on his own. If he if he heard somebody that was significant in intellect, then he would bring them and say, "Okay, you know, let's let's get this together and let's figure out some uh, some some good ideas." And so, anyone that uh, they reformed education, that there it is, they they reformed education in schools because up up till that time, schools were mostly for the rich. And so if you were top class, you got to go to school. If you were poor and you couldn't find somebody to sponsor you into school, you know, you just kind of had to fend for yourself. Well, he had an idea, you know, I think everybody needs to be educated. And so he did school reform so that, uh, that even the poor could go to school. Uh, his scholars reformed handwriting and manuscripts. We've talked about a lot of old Greek manuscripts and, and Latin and things like that. Have you, uh, I know I've thrown some on the screen, but have you ever looked at some of the, like, ancient, ancient manuscripts, and it looks like just everything runs together? That's because it did. And so part of his reforms uh, brought in things like, that we take for granted, like punctuation, capitalization, because everything was basically capital, all right, so capitalization, punctuation, spacing between words, what a novel concept, you know, because if you can try to imagine uh, learning something in another language and everything runs together and you don't even know where the words, you know, start and stop, you know, that would be difficult. So these are some of the reforms that, that uh, he brought during his time. Uh, Charlemagne would send heralds throughout the kingdom to announce moral proclamations uh, to take care of the poor and and uh, he would, you know, like have a, have a message to remind people to uh, take care of their neighbors and, and things like that. And he would, you know, they would stand on the street corner and say, Charlemagne says, you know, feed your poor neighbor or whatever. You know, I don't know what the exact words were. Uh, but, but he was very involved in that. Um, he made four trips to Rome during his reign. And the fourth was on Christmas Day in the year 800. Something significant happened on this day. Pope Leo III... While uh, Charlemagne was was worshiping on Christ, Christmas Day, the story is uh, that that Pope Leo the Third comes up behind him, puts a crown on his head, and declares him the emperor of the Roman Empire or, or over the West, basically. And uh, so this has been interpreted uh, that that he said or referred to him as the Holy Roman Emperor. And there's something that comes later, um, and it's 
loosely tied to this time, but there's something we'll talk about called the Holy Roman Empire, where the, the Roman Empire w was actually more the church than it was the state. Uh, but And so some say that he was the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, that's not officially. We can look back on that and say that, but it wasn't officially at this time. But uh, this caused a little bit of problem because where's the Roman emperor, emperor at this time? Constantinople, right? And so when they got word that uh, Charlemagne's been named the emperor of Rome, then they, they're feeling a little threatened, right? Uh, the Byzantine Empire at this time, it, it was really in a bit of a mess. And I'll, I'll just kind of give you something brief here, and this is going to set up what our discussion is going to be in a minute. But since Justinian I, or Justinian the Great, as we've talked about, he was the one that was married to Theodora, if you remember that. He died in, in 585. The Byzantine Empire had continued on with like a different emperor every few years. You know, just they were, they were constantly changing. And in, in uh, 717, Leo III took the throne. This is not the Pope Leo III. There's multiple Leos. Um, but he, uh, he reigned for 24 years from 717 to 741. And uh, he was actually able to repel the Arab siege of Constantinople, which there were several of those uh, during that time we were talking about when the spread of Islam, there were several sieges of Constantinople. Uh, then his son Constantine V reigned for 34 years from 341 to 775, and uh, he continued in his father's uh, iconoclastic policies. This is what we're going to talk about later, so just kind of hold on to that term, and won several victories against the Arabs and the Bulgars. Uh, in 775, his son Leo IV took the throne but died in 780. Constantine VI, which was Leo's son, uh, was crowned at the age of nine. Not a lot of nine-year-olds can run an empire, right? So uh, the, the, the nine-year-old's mother was named regent, okay? And so basically, you know, she's, she's empress by proxy, right? So she's, she's kind of running the show. And uh, Constantine took over when he turned 19 years old. You know, he was old enough to kind of do it and, you know, take over the, the uh, emperorship, I guess. But in 790, uh, 797, Irene was his mother's name. She overthrew him, blinded him, and put him in prison. And a few, day, few days later, uh, he died probably of his injuries. Uh, Irene uh, called the Second Council of uh, Nicaea, which condemned the practice of iconoclasm and restored the veneration of icons to Christian practice. Again, hold on to that. Does anybody know what iconoclasm is? It's going to be praying to saints, probably. Isn't it? <laughs> uh, close. Uh, but again, you know, the less you know, the more I can tell you. Uh, Charlemagne writes a letter to Constantinople because remember they were kind of upset because they're going through all this. You know, uh, you know, Irene's kind of in charge of things when this is happening to Charlemagne. And so they're worried that, you know, this person's rising up over here and going to try to, you know, eclipse the Byzantine Empire. And so uh, he writes a letter and says, hey, you know, I have no intent in taking over over there. You know, let's, you know, you, you be the over the east and I'll be over the west and we'll just get along and, and maybe we can work together to spread the gospel around the world. You know, and that was kind of uh, Charlemagne and, and uh, what his thought process was. Uh, Charlemagne got sick and died in uh, 814. His last words were, into your hands, O Lord, I commit my spirit. And so he goes, he goes all the way out, uh, you know, giving credit to the Lord and, and uh, giving, giving his life to the Lord. In his will, he left most of his wealth to the church to be used for charitable purposes. So, you know, if anybody, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. If, no, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but the whole kingdom was in mourning. Because they, they love Charlemagne, and, and he was just one of those leaders that, that everybody had affection for. And so when he was lost, you know, it was like, what are we going to do? Charlemagne's gone. And, and uh, so the whole, the whole country was in mourning. Um, for succession, Charlemagne uh, had set up his only surviving son, Louis the Pious, as his successor. So Louis reigned until 840. And during his reign, he divided the kingdoms with his three sons, Lothair, Louis the German, and Charles the Bald. After Louis's death, the... That first guy's name is Lothair. 
<laughs> lot, this is lot hair, lot hair and Charles the Bald. <laughs> Good observation. <laughs> That's right, see, no spaces. And so, uh, uh, so a civil war kind of broke out between the brothers because, you know, the, the Lot Hare and Charles the Ball didn't get along too good or whatever. <laughs> and uh, so, so they just decided, you know, it's best if we just go to our own separate rooms, right? And so they basically divided, divided the, uh, the, the kingdom up into three different regions. So we have uh, Lot Hare. Thank you very much for that. We have <laughs> Lothair. Uh, right, right here in Italy, he died shortly after all this happened, and this part of Italy really uh, broke up into multiple factions for years and years and years to come, and, and really, uh, I mean, a lot of years, and so it's a long time before Italy is really pulled back together. But does anybody know what these two areas become? France and Germany. France and Germany. So these two, th this split right here sets up France and Germany. And so that's that kind of brings us to kind of uh, a modern feel to the way the map is shaping up. So let's get on to a discussion here just a little bit. And let's talk about iconography and the intercession of the saints. Around the third century, around the third century, uh, a belief arose that a departed believer could intercede to God for someone still living. And this led to believers making requests to these saints so that they could bring their petition to God. And uh, to validate this practice, uh, the, the story uh, of Luke 16 is, is often told. Does anybody know what's in Luke 16? Like rich, man rich man and Lazarus. Very good. And so uh, they use this story saying that, you know, the, the, the rich man and Lazarus, they both die uh, the rich man was evil and the, the, you know, Lazarus was good. And so uh, the, the parable says that Lazarus is put in uh, Abraham's bosom and uh, the uh, rich man goes to jail, uh, to jail goes to hell. And uh, he, he looks up and he can see Lazarus there, you know, being rewarded. And he's in this tor torment. And so he talks to Abraham and you remember the conversation, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, they say, well, you know, that tells us, Jesus is saying this, and, and that tells us that there can be a communication, uh, you know, between people that have already departed. And so uh, the, the reason is the departed saints are closer to God, right? So they're, they're up there closer to God. So if we, if we give our petitions to them, then they can bring those petitions to God because they're closer, Okay, just hold, hold all that in. Uh, it became useful, though, to, to paint pictures, and I'm thankful for the artwork and the pictures that, that we have uh, because, you know, they're useful for slides, right, uh, and to be able to put on the screen. But the, these, uh, you know, the Virgin Mary or, or Christ or uh, I think this is uh, Peter and, and James and John maybe or, uh, you know, but these, the, the icons of the saints became useful because it could give kind of a reference to, okay, you know, I'm, I'm praying that St. Peter will bring my petition to uh, God, or, you know, I'm praying to St. Michael, or, you know, and, and it's not that they're worshiping officially, theologically, people that practice this, they're not worshiping these icons, okay? Theologically, they're praying that, uh, that these saints that have gone on before are taking their petitions to God. So it's a visual aid. It's a visual aid, basically, yes. So let's talk about Byzantine iconoclasm. Uh, Byzantine iconoclasm were periods of time where the, the Roman emperor or the Byzantine emperor decided that, you know, this looks too much like a breaking of the second, uh, the second commandment that says not to have any graven images made before me. And they looked at them as idols, and so they started. They started going through, and uh, this is this is one that was defaced. But they they'd go through and they'd destroy these icons and and do their best to you know it's like idol smashing or icon smashing. So that's where the word iconoclasm comes from. They go through and they destroy these icons. 
because they said that worship belongs to God alone and not to these these icons. And so you remember Irene, you know, after many years of outlawing, basically uh, praying to other saints, Irene comes back in and she reverses that and puts that back into practice to the where they're doing that. So let's let's talk about this just a little bit. Let's talk about the uh, Luke account. Before I offer my thoughts, let me see what your thoughts are. Let's talk about that account in Luke. Uh, first of all, nowhere did Jesus say that anyone living interacted with them. Okay, so in that story, there's a conversation between the rich man and Abraham, right? But, but nowhere did anybody talk to the people that were still living, nor was there anyone in the story that was living that was talking to the people that had already departed. Right. Didn't he, didn't he say there was a great gulf between them? Absolutely. So there's a lot to, to support this. There's a lot that's left out of the narrative of that story. Uh, that if you take that story in context, remember the last two weeks we talked a lot about the Word of God in context. So when you look at this story in context, we see that it doesn't really support. Another, another verse that they cite, Revelation 5.8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And so they say, well, see here, you know, the saints before God were, were holding the prayers of the, God's people before, uh, before God. Uh, first of all, to uh, get this, I don't think y'all want to stay here long enough for us to go into a deep dive on who the 24 elders are. Okay, uh, but we w we would have to you know have to uh, find out you know who who are the 24 elders and you know they uh, some believe that they are the raptured church, all right. Some believe that they represent both the 12 tribes of Israel plus the 12 apostles. And so there's a lot of theories as, as to who the 24 elders are. Um, and we also have to understand the timeline of this in Romans 5:8 is after the rapture. So it doesn't say that this is something that's concurrent with our current time that we're living in. Another thing that uh, gets brought into this conversation is the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12. They said, you know, well, you know, they say that uh, Hebrews 12.1 says that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And I, I was watching an interview uh, between, uh, I've told you about Matt uh, Whitman before in, in his um, uh, podcast that he has, and he goes into has conversations with people from other churches, and so he was talking about the icon. This this was an Orthodox church. The uh, uh, wall was just full of all these icons all the way around the wall, and and they take comfort in having these these saints, you know, people that have been venerated as saints around them because you know they come in and and they can pick someone, you know, that oh, I'm going to go here and pray for, you know, pray. Uh, to St. Peter, or I'm going to pray to St. John, or whatever, you know, and, and they can go to the, the different icons, and that's that's where they're praying for that saint to uh, take that prayer up to heaven, and, and they consider that their cloud of witnesses that's around them. Uh, again, context, right? So let's look at this in full context, Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking where? To Jesus. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, uh, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated where? At the right hand. At the right hand of the throne of God. Keep that in mind to tie into scriptures we're going to read in just a minute. Uh, so this cloud of witnesses, nowhere did it say that we're entrusting our petitions to this cloud of witnesses. And I've heard all kind of theories on what the cloud of witnesses are. First of all, what is a witness? Somebody is it is it one who brings your petition to God? It, it's somebody that saw something, right? And so this cloud of witnesses, it's talking about these men of faith that was just in Hebrews 11, right, the, the chapter before. All these men of faith have witnessed the power of God, and they testify to the power of God. So we have these witnesses 
that have gone on before us. That's, that's what that's talking about. Uh, but Jesus is the one that's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and we look to him, not to the witnesses. Okay? So to believe one can pray uh, to a departed in heaven, you would have to ascribe some characteristics to that person. And this is, this is really the first place my mind goes. If Mary is, okay, so it's like, I mean, we talked about Mariology already, but, you know, you have uh, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then you have Mary, and then you have all the other saints. That's basically the, the hierarchy, okay? Because remember, uh, Mary, Theotokos, Mother of God, she's kind of almost raised to a divine level, not officially in theology, but in practice. And so if, you're, if we're here and we're praying to Mary, and someone is in... South America and they're praying to Mary and someone is in Africa and they're praying to Mary what are we subscribing to Mary is Mary omnipresent she is not and if we uh, how many of you sometimes pray without moving your mouth and without actually using your vocal cords you pray in your spirit right in your thoughts and prayers so if you pray to a saint in your thoughts and prayers, what are you also subscribing to them? <laughs> and so we're, we would have to say that these saints are both omnipresent and omniscient for them to be able to operate in the way that they are supposed to, to operate, if they are indeed uh, ferrying your prayers to God. All right. So how should we look at this scripturally? Let's look at let's look at real scripture, and see what uh, what the Bible has to say about it. Let's go back to Revelation, since Revelation is one of the one of the scriptures they use. Uh, Revelation 19:10. It says, "At this I fell at his feet to worship him." Now what's going on here is an angel is showing some things to John. Okay, so this is just an angel, and he's showing things to John. And uh, so at this, I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. So who's his brothers and sisters? John. I mean, he's at this point in Revelation, remember, this is like 95. All the other apostles have died off. John's the last one left. And the angel's saying, you know, all your brothers and sisters, uh, you know, we're just all servants of what? We're servants of God. You know, so don't worship me. Don't worship them. Don't, don't fall down at their feet. We worship God only. Um, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. Jesus. Leviticus 19.31. The, the next two are from the law, but they're very significant. 19.31. It says, Do not defile yourselves by turning to mediums or to those who consult the spirits of the dead. I am the Lord your God. Yes. Are we to pray to those that have gone on before us? No. Deuteronomy 19.10 says, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter uh, as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is what? An abomination to the Lord. That's pretty clear from the law. Unless you just want to say, well, none of the law is for us. So let's go to the New Testament, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. Let's just pause there for a second. So intercession is a real thing, right? Intercession is a real thing for us to intercede for one another. Prayer, supplication, intercession, that's living to living. Okay, so, so I, can, I can intercede for Lisa this week. You know, I can, I can intercede for, uh, you know, situations that, that are going on. You know, I can stand in the gap is another phrase that we use sometimes. All right, that's living to living. Verse 2, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing to the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is what? One 
one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So there's only one mediator between God and man. Jesus. There, there's no one else that's that's in between and that's there, there's no additional farriers of the prayers to God. There's one mediator, there's one that stands in between. And when we pray, we pray to Christ who is sitting where? At the right hand of the Father making intercession, intercession for us. You don't need Saint Peter. You don't need Saint Mary or Saint this or that. As a matter of fact, biblically speaking, who are the saints? We are. We are. Okay, and probably both living and, you know, you don't have to die and, and have uh, some special miracle or be a, a martyr or anything like that to be declared a saint. Uh, Paul referred to the, the, the church as saints uh, quite often. Awesome. Roman 8.34, Romans 8.34 says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Hebrews 4.14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the, the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as, uh, as we are, yet without sin. Let us... Uh, with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we, we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is my second to last scripture and I uh, chose it in this position because we have confidence to draw near to the throne of grace. What, what another version, what do we, right, come boldly before the throne of grace is what some versions say. And we can do, do we, the argument is what? The, the saints are already closer to God, so we can, we can pray to them and they'll take our prayers to God because they're closer. No, this says, let us, us then with confidence. confidence draw near to the throne of grace. You don't need, the veil is torn, that's right. You don't need someone else being a go-between because you can approach the throne of grace through the blood of Christ. And lastly this. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No, no one comes to the Father except through me. Through me. Amen. Not through any of the saints, not through any other means. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. And we can have confidence that when we pray, that when we fall on our knees and fall on our face before God, that he hears us and, and we don't need other mediators and we don't need other, other means by which to be heard by God because he loves us, he cares for us, and he wants to listen to us. He wants to hear us. And I'm so thankful that we have a God who is, and I say it this way a lot, attentive to our prayers, attentive to our needs. He's not far off. He's not... At a distance, and we talked about this last week in, in witnessing to, to some that, you know, God interacts with his people. And we don't need other mediators because the price has already been paid by one, and that's Jesus Christ.